Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger, and I'm the Director of Marketing at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, lectures, readings, fashion shows, and archaeology lectures. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. On behalf of the National Arts Club, the President, and the Board of Governors, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event and introduce Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, the Chair of our Archaeology Committee. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Nadine. And good morning, afternoon or evening, depending upon where you reside. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, as you've heard, and delighted to welcome today's audience to a fascinating lecture entitled, The Reign of Tukitkamen, What New Evidence Reveals About King Tut, presented in collaboration with the American Research Center's National Headquarters and New York chapter. Most of you know about the legendary Tukitkamen, who reigned between 1333 and 1323 BCE, unless we get different information this evening, with his rich burial chamber discovered in 1922 by the Earl of Carnovan and Howard Carter. Innumerable lavish exhibitions have revolved around the boy king. Long deemed an unimportant ruler, his sovereignty was largely disregarded because of its short duration. However, considerable documentation to the contrary is available nowadays. Professor Nazuma Kawai introduces the current understanding of Tukitkamen and his time utilizing new information. Permit me to relate how this program came to be. My husband and I participated in the American Research Center in Egypt's King to Common Centennial Anniversary Tour last October and November. Our expert guide was the internationally renowned Dr. Nozuma Kawai. I was continually exceedingly impressed by the breadth of his knowledge and humanity. Some of you may even have seen him in advance of today's intriguing event if you viewed my introduction to the Darnell's talk entitled, When Ignatan and Nefertiti Were Gods on Earth, in which I briefly spoke with Professor Kawai at the entrance to King Tut's tomb and spontaneously requested that he participate in a club program. I was that impressed. Today is that fortunate outcome. Incidentally, the link to that talk as well as to Mark Gaboldi's The Fate of Missing and Diverted Artifacts from Tukitkamen's Tomb, and Alan Zivi's Renewing Amor from Sakara, which includes Tut's nurse Maya, can all be found under chat. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the extraordinary Dr. Nazuma Kawai, Professor of Egyptology and Director of the Institute for the Study of Ancient Civilizations and Cultural Resources at Japan's Kanazawa University. He received his John, I'm sorry, he received his doctorate from John Hopkins University, studying on Aussie's immediate past president and club lecturer, Betsy Bryan was an R.C. Samuel H. Kress Fellow, as well as visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. Specialist in the New Kingdom's 18th Dynasty, about which he has written numerous books and articles, such as for the scribes, and lacking two could come in, I show that to you, issue, he discusses King Tut in tonight's program. If that doesn't suffice, Professor Kawai also directs the Japanese Egyptian mission to North Saqqara. During the previous season, 
the excavators located a number of tombs from varying periods, such as the early dynastic, New Kingdom, Late Period, and Greco-Roman, the subject of next year's forthcoming National Geographic documentary film. It is a privilege to request that Dr. Kawai addresses our audience. Nzumo, if you will. Thank you very much, Michelle, for a wonderful introduction. I am greatly honored to be invited to give a lecture for the National Arts Club. And uh, I really appreciate, appreciate all the participants uh, who will listen to my talk. So let me share my slide with you. Okay. So despite Tutankhamun's tomb discovered 101 years ago this year, being the richest ever found in Egypt, his reign has been obscured due to the erasure of his memory by later kings and the, and the dearth of hard evidence of his time. He was long considered an, an important king and his reign was largely disregarded for its short duration of less than a decade. However, a considerable evidence to the contrary is available nowadays, thanks to recent archeological excavations, epigraphic studies in the temples and tombs, and meticulous research in museums worldwide. This lecture introduced the current understanding of Tunankamon and his time utilizing new evidence about the king and his court officials. Tutankhamun was obviously not listed in the king's list inscribed during Ramses II's reign. His name was excused because he was related to Akhenaten, who introduced the new god Aten as national deity of Egypt. So between the uh, Amenhotep III and uh, uh, Horemheb, who are inscribed on this wall, there are almost five kings uh, missing, as we know today. Now we know that Tutankhamun was the 13th king during the 18th dynasty, who ruled the post amon period. Although the situation of his royal succession is still controversial. Tutankhamun was recognized publicly as a Prince Tut Ankh Aten during the Akhenaten's reign. His name was mentioned and his images were represented in some royal monuments at Amarna. For this reason, Tut Ankh Aten, literally, the living image of Aten might have been the crown prince of Akhenaten, who likely regarded him as his legitimate successor. But who is the mother of Tutankhamun? Some scholars have suggested that Tutankhamun was the son of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. However, Raymond Johnson, the former director of the epigraphic survey of the University of Chicago, recently presented some important evidence to prove that Akhenaten's second wife, Kia, is Tutankhamun's mother. So this is the uh, image I borrowed from the website of uh, Nie Karlsberg Griptek Copenhagen, where they uh, had special exhibition on Amarna period. One of the highlights of exhibition was the, uh, the joint uh, two taratats. As you see on the left, you have the, uh, the block showing Akhenaten, uh, uh, sacrifice duck. And on the right, you have block showing Kia, which was uh, exhibited in Nichols, but group, group today. Ray Johnson discovered they joined together. And as you see here, uh, Akhenaten and Kier had a special relationship. So none of the Brock depicts Nefertiti 
in this uh, special uh, monument. There are some images of Prince Tutankhamun at Amarna from the Tarthat blocks that initially decorate the monuments at Amarna and were reused in Hermopolis. Ray Johnson studied these blocks and succeeded in some reconstructions of the wall scene, which has not been entire has have not been entirely published yet. Uh, he proved that Akhenaten's second wife here had a close relationship with Tutankhaten. For example, the block above here, I can show you that this one uh, is recognized as a part of the scene on the bed depicting Prince Tutankhaten, Akhenaten, and here as well as other princesses. So his new uh, idea, it, it was presented in the Tutankhamun Centennial Conference in Luxor, uh, November the 4th of 2022, last year. And this was uh, actually uh, online by the American Research Center. So you can access to his lecture led by a, a German uh, scholar, uh, Christian uh, uh, buyer. Uh, so I can't show you the exact uh, image he reconstructed, uh, but if you are interested, please take a look at this wonderful lecture uh, by him. By the way, there was another male who seems to have been regarded as Akhenaten's successor, Sumenkara. Sumenkara appears to have shared the throne with Akhenaten late in his reign as co-regent. Akhenaten's eldest daughter, Merit Arden, became Sumenkara's great royal wife. Sumenkara's reign was very short, probably less than a year, as suggested by the year date found on hieratic dockets bearing his name. After Sumenkara's death, Akhenaten's chief queen, Nefertiti, apparently assumed the role of his co-regent as female ruler, Nefer-Nefer Aten, with the epithet beneficial for her husband, which was identified by, identified by Mark Gabold. Gabold and some other scholars believe that Nefer-Nefer Aten was made to Aten. Ray Johnson has recent, recently reconstructed the wall scene showing Akhenaten, his co-regent Nefer Nefer Aten, and Prince Ankhsenpa Aten, as you can see on this slide. These three people appeared to have been the last royal family represented at the end of Akhenaten's reign. Part of the private stira known as the co-regency stira, found in the North Harim of the Central Palace at Amarna provides essential information on Nefer Nefer Aten. Four cartouches of two kings are presented, preserved on the right hand top of the steer. Two cartouches give the prenomen and nomen of Akhenaten, while other two are altered and refer to King Nefer Nefer Aten. Nefer Nefer Aten's presence in Amon is, is well attested. The fragments of the mutual paint, mural paintings from the walls of Northern Riverside Paris include the cartouches of Nefer Nefer Aten. The nomen Nefer Nefer Aten, Ak Enki S, which means beneficial for her husband, as you can see here and there, uh, and prenomen An Hepera, Merit Nefer Hepera are also mentioned. Akhenaten's name is also mentioned on the mural fragment. Thus, this is also the evidence to suggest that Nefer Nefer Aten had an epithet beneficial for her husband while she was co regent of Akhenaten. After Akhenaten's demise, Nefer Nefer Aten seems to have assumed the soul ring, which probably lasted for about three years. A graffito 
written by a certain Pa Waf in the tomb of Pai Titi 139 suggests that by year three of Nefer Nefer Atem, the return to orthodoxy was initiated. However, she maintained the cult of Aten and the capital at Amarn. Presumably, the movement to restore the traditional religion, religion was stipulated after the death of Atanten, who considered himself the sole master of the cult of Aten. The fact that a number of objects found in Tutankhamun's tomb had been made for the burial of Nefer Nefer Aten, adopted and re-inscribed for Tutankhamun's use, implies that Tutankh Aten and his entourage did not want to recognize the preceding reign. Tutankh uh, Nefer Nefer Aten had assumed the sole reign despite the fact that Tutank Aten, the crown prince, was the legitimate successor of Akhenaten, instead of giving up her kingship to a young boy, Nefer Nefer Aten may have wished to continue her sole rule not only because she was already reigning, but also Tutank Aten was just a boy between five and ten years old, and he was not her son. Although Tutan, uh, Nefer Nefer Atom began restoring the cult of Amun and other deities, she also maintained the cult of Atom at Amona, resulting, the, resulting in a dissatisfied faction of officials and priests who advocated quick return to orthodoxy. Here you have a pectoral originally made for Nefer Nefer Aten's burial, showing the traditional goddess nude, which was used for Tutankhamun's burial. Now, I would like to focus on the return to orthodoxy. Tutankh Aten likely ascended to the throne at Memphis at around the age of eight. He seems to have abandoned Akhet Aten the capital created by Akhenaten immediately, as he did not leave any royal monument there. Tutank Aten worshipped Amun and other traditional deities, since the movement back toward the orthodoxy had already been initiated under Nefer Nefer Aten. So here I can show you a stira uh, depicting Tutank Aten worshipping Amun and Mut. Unfortunately, this still was completely destroyed during the World War II due to the bomb. But uh, uh, this is a picture uh, left in the museum, uh, Egyptian Museum in Berlin. Tutank Aten and Ankesempa Aten changed their name to Tutank Amun and Ankesenamun, respectively, at the time of the removal of the capital to Memphis. Tutank Aten and Tutank Amun, worshipping two national gods, Amun and Aten, at the same time, for a very short period, as depicted in the stira, as I show you the previous uh, slide, and the golden slide, golden throne on this slide. As I will present later, Thebes again as the center of state religion and vigorously carried out restoration program throughout the country at the same time. Tutank Amun's restoration still provides us with information on the policies of the early part of Tutank Amun's reign. Although some scholars suggest that the degree was issued in Tutank Amun's year, five, or year one, it is more likely that the restoration still documents institutionalization of the restoration program describing what had already been affected to the benefit of the traditional cults, as Marian Eaton class rightly suggested. In this theory, Tutankhamun descended, <coughs> excuse me, described the time before he ascended to the throne as a phase 
when the gods were absent, resulting in a human, political, and religious catastrophe without naming the concrete reasons that supposedly led Egypt into this enormous crisis. According to the Stira, Tutankhamun's first imperative was the restoration and reopening of the temple of the traditional cults throughout Egypt, accompanied by amends to the ravaged temples. Ravaged temples. First, he embellished the divine statues of Amun and other traditional gods which were ignored or destroyed during Akhenaten's reign. Second, the king installed the children of influential local officials in the priesthood across the ranks. Third, he increased the revenue of the temples and the cities in, in private property. In other words, the properties owned by the kings and Aten temples during the Amarna period were redirected to the temples of traditional cults and local cities. Fourth, male and female servants and singers were consecrated and protected from all standard requisition of the temple property by the state. Actually, this still was com completely, uh, in this still, the name of Tutankhamun was completely recurved by Horemheb. And uh, interestingly, the image of Ankhsen uh, Amun, uh, who who was depicted behind Tutankhamun was completely erased, as I could uh, observe in the Egyptian museum. Now, let's take a look at some of the physical evidence of the Tutankhamun's restoration and the building project. We need to check whether the text mentioned in the restoration still was uh, carried out, uh, in fact. My investigation of Tutankhamun's monument in Karnak revealed that he often focused his activities on the key areas of the temple and the main processional ways. At least two stira, including famous restoration stira, were installed in front of the third pylon, which was probably the first main gate of the Karnak temple at that time. The figure of Amun, expunged by the agent of Akhenaten were restored along the main axis. So here uh, I pointed uh, location of the uh, stira I examined uh, in Karnak temple. So they are all located in important area or main axis of the temple. So this is a uh, fragment published by uh, a French scholar. Uh, actually, this is a new fragment found uh, in Karnak, a new fragment of Restoration Stira, which was reused in the Coptic period to make uh, olive uh, oil. And then uh, when I was... Uh, Walking in the Egyptian museum, I bumped into this stira. Uh, although the uh, pre provenance is not uh, uh, written in the uh, journal d'entre, uh, but I believe that this was originally set up in the Karnak temple. And although the text is missing, uh, I suggest that this stira shows the Tutankhamun's coronation, which was published in 2002. In the third pylon and the seventh pylon, there are small stira, Tutankhamun, uh, show, uh, uh, showing Tutankhamun, uh, bringing the uh, bundle of lotus, which means uh, restoration for the uh, cult of Amun and uh, related deities. So, here and there, you have uh, the uh, image of Amun and the Mut, and sometimes you have the image of the founder of Karnak Temple, the Senwasa the first. So I can't show you the image 
of the uh, the stela showing the Sengu set of course, but I'm uh, now working uh, on the publication of this stela. And seven spire uh, south, uh, although now the entire stela is missing, we can just see the base, but uh, we could uh, see the uh, black and white photo in the archive of Franco-Egyptian Center at Karnak. And this stira was already, uh, two fragments are published by Otto Schaden, but I found yet another fragment and joined uh, together uh, on, on computer. So this stira is interesting. Here you have the image of Tutankhamun uh, bringing the bundle of lotus, and you have the image Amun and uh, uh, Mut. And behind him is the uh, kind of <clears throat> uh, cutting uh, rectangular in rectangular shape. And I found some uh, holes, kind of perforation, which was originally used to insert the some uh, inlays. So I believe that there was another image, perhaps the image of Ankesunamen, but later her image was entirely erased, like as we saw the uh, her image on the restoration stira. So what happened after uh, the deaths of An uh, Tutankhamun and Ankesunamen when Horem have ascended to the throne. This is a question. On the wall of the east face of the sixth pylon, uh, Tutankhamun left three renewal formula for Amun uh, here and there, but they are also re-inscribed by Horem Heb. And recently, uh, in front of the wall I just show you, uh, the, the statue of Amun was re-restored by Franco-Egyptian mission. I think it was probably last year. And then, so if you come to Egypt next time, you can uh, see the uh, updated reconstruction of the statue of Amun with a facial feature of Tutankhamun. The outer wall of the court of Kashet at Karnak was all also restored by Frank Egyptian Center. So I borrowed uh, the image from them. And here, uh, this part, you can find uh, some remnant of the decoration uh, uh, made by Tutankhamun. Here, you have uh, the image of Amun and Amunet in the center of this outer wall of the Court of Gashet. Horig Suruzian uh, identified the, a sphinx of, uh, with the face of Amun, but the face is definitely Tutankhamun's face, as I can uh, show you as a comparison, uh, show, show you the statue of Amun as a comparison. And the, thick, the, the photograph uh, taken in 1858, uh, you can see the Sphinx is on near the probably original location, as you see here. And uh, somehow this uh, Sphinx was transported, uh, now uh, located in the garden, uh, entrance garden of the Alexandria Water General Authority. So I hope I can visit and take a look at uh, this uh, in the future. Tutankhamun left a number of uh, statues in Karnak complex. So there are uh, several statues, uh, but not only the statue of the image of the king, but sometimes he is shown as image of deity, as I sh showed you uh, Tutankhamun's face as God Amun, but here Tutankhamun is represented as God Consul. The restoration of statues of Amun, which were uh, made before Amarna period, were restored 
during the Tutankhamun's reign. So here you have the statue of Amun and the Totem of the Third, but the face of Amun was completely destroyed during the time of Akhenaten. But Tutankhamun uh, commissioned uh, to restore the face. So only the facial future is like the face of Tutankhamun, totally different from the face of Totem of the Third. In, on the right, you can see the uh, Arabasta statue, uh, the triad of Amun and the Mood and the King. And uh, uh, if you see the line of the Arabasta here, it's a horizontal. But if you look at the uh, upper uh, half of this uh, uh, triad, you can see the line is vertical, which means the upper part was uh, uh, you know joined later when the Tutankhamun restored so the facial future of these blocks date to the time of Tutankhamun uh, also the inscription uh, written on the lower part is I mean uh, Totem the first so there are a number of restoration the physical evidence of restoration going on the Sphinx between Tens Pyron and the precinct of Mood were transformed from heads showing Akhenaten and Nefertiti into those of Creo Sphinx, uh, and uh, uh, which possesses small statues of uh, Tutankhamun under the chins of uh, these Sphinx. So there is only one Creo Sphinx you can see on this slide here. But uh, these small statues, most of them are now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo or situated under the chin of Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun appears to have been, have begun building his memorial temple at Karnak. However, this monument was separately left unfinished in its initial stages. I went to, on to complete the temple as a dual memorial temple to propagate his association with Tutankhamun and legitimate him as a successor. Stains in the temp temple show several rituals to Amun performed by Tutankhamun, accompanied by the official eye behind him. Most of the blocks of this temple are reused as fill of the second and ninth pile at Karnak by Horemheb. So this, uh, these blocks are now being studied by uh, MacGabalt, and uh, uh, there are uh, hundreds of fragments in the area between the main temple of Amun at Karnak and the Honsu temple. So you can uh, take a look at, you can find some of the cartouches of uh, Tutankhamun on this part of the uh, Karnak precinct. And even Inside of the ninth pylon, uh, you can find the columns with the name of uh, Tutankhamun. And in the Khonsu temple, there are some battle scenes which were originally, uh, you know, uh, uh, decorated the temple of Tutankhamun, but reused for the wall, one of the walls of the Khonsu temple. And uh, these blocks were studied by Raymond Johnson for his uh, PhD dissertation, and uh, he reconstructed Asiatic battle scene. Uh, and uh, this uh, scene was decorated in the outer part of the Tutankhamun temple. There are other blocks in, this is in the, uh, uh, I think the uh, our open air museum in Karnak, uh, you can find there. And uh, uh, yeah, this block, this uh, block I just show you, joined another piece, and also uh, depiction of eye can be identified. Actually, the here you can't really see the image of eye, but the inscription actually indicate there was an image of eye inscribed behind Tutankhamun. And there are other two, two blocks showing the uh, Godfather eye 
depicted behind Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun continued an unfinished work of Amenhotep III's building project, neglected by Akhenaten. By resuming the building program of Amenhotep III, Tutankhamun aimed to legitimize himself as successor, successor of last Orthodox king before Akhenaten. For example, Tutankhamun decorated the colonnade hall of Luxor Temple, which Akhenaten left unfinished and neglected. So you can find the image of Tutankhamun presenting a ritual to the god Amun. But here as well, you can see the name of Horemheb inscribed above the name of Tutankhamun. So this is a, a beautiful line drawing made by epigraphic survey. As you see, the Tutankhamun performs the ritual for Amun. On the scene of Opet Festival, Amenhotep III, uh, on the scene of Opet Festival, Amenhotep III is represented as the statues of the deified and the deceased former king on each divine bark of the procession conducted by Tutankhamun. This suggests that Tutankhamun's association with Amenhotep III was displayed publicly during the festival as pol political propaganda, likely strengthening his legitimacy as the successor of the orthodoxy. On the west bank of Thebes, Tutankhamun left his restoration inscription at the memorial temple of Amenhotep III, as you can see here which was used for the memorial temple of Merem Ptah. So, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, the block uh, which has the restoration formula by Tutankham, but his name was re-inscribed by Seti I. In fact, Tutankham commissioned to rest restore the number of temples throughout Egypt from Delta to Nubia. But he also built a number of monuments in many places as he wants to pacify his God as one of his name represents. So these were the blocks which I found in the basement of the Egyptian museum at Karnak. And this will be published uh, soon. So this was uh, probably Tutankhamun's shrine in Heliopolis, the sacred place of God Ra, but uh, you can see the depiction of Amun uh, here, but the Fu Amun in the midst of Eunu, the in the midst of Heliopolis. So even in the Heliopolis, uh, Amun's cult was restored. Actually, during the time of Akhenaten, Heliopolis was maintained as the center of the, you know, Sora deity. But, you know, as as you know, the, the relationship with Amun was uh, rejected during the time of Akhenaten, but now Tutankhamun brought Amun back to Heliopolis as well. So this is a Tutankhamun's rest house, just uh, close to the uh, Kafra's uh, mortuary temple at Giza. Uh, now the uh, this uh, building is uh, gone, but you have the door jam and rintel uh, with the name of Tutankhamun and Ankesen Amun in Egyptian Museum Cairo. And Tutankhamun left uh, many other uh, monuments in Memphis. This is one of the uh, door jam. Uh, and also in Abydos, uh, now uh, this stira is exhibited in the Louvre Abu Dhabi. So here you have the image of Tutankhamun worshipping uh, Osiris, the, the god of Abydos. And, uh, and here, uh, one of the uh, priests of Osiris, uh, High priest of Osiris is uh, uh, bringing offering to Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun uh, elected two temples in Nubia, uh, in Faras and Kawa. 
In Pharos, temple was called pacifying the gods. The same time, same as his golden horse name. There, Tutankhamun was worshipped during his lifetime as Amenhotep III in Soreb Temple. Tutankhamun also left his restoration formula on a recumbent lion statue in the temple at Soreb. Here, as you see here, it's in the British Museum. And the Temple of Kawa, uh, although oh, we don't, we can't really find the uh, remains of the temple, but now the most of the blocks in the cult cartoon mu museum. In some uh, of this part, I'd like to point out the following. Although Nefer Nefer Aten reasserts, uh, reasserts Amun's prominent position at his cult center at Kaunak, actual physical restoration activity seems to have been initiated in Tutankhamun's reign. Tutankhamun's reign was marked by a significant increase in artistic architectural activities throughout Egypt, despite of the short reign. Also, it is possible to know Tutankhamun's entire restoration and building activities attested archaeological evidence implies that Tutankhamun's restoration and reactivation of the temple throughout Egypt. Now, I would like to focus on Tutankhamun's court officials who seems to have controlled the government during his reign. Tutankhamun ascended to the throne at around eight years old, was at least no older than 10. He could have ruled the country along with the support of some senior officials and the courtiers Amin, as Amenhotep III did. Amenhotep III ascended to the throne when he was around five, in fact. However, power instead passed into the hands of influential officials. The most representative depiction of Tutankhamun's code officials appears in the tomb of Maya, Tutankhamun's wet nurse at Saqqara, discovered in 1996 by Aranzibi. This depiction is a part of the scene showing the officials bending down and paying homage to the kings seated on the throne. As you see in this slide, the, the depiction of the number of officials standing behind the king implies political situation of Tutankhamun's reign. Those dignitaries are certainly actual power holders behind the king. Two men with a shaven head in the front part must be the two viziers positioned after the king in the administration in ancient Egypt. However, before the vizier, two men appears to be the most critical officials. One falls fun across and the battle axe, and the other has fun across and the hacker scepter. So here you have viziers, shaven head, and then you have uh, two officials uh, in front of them. Also, Aranzibi, who published a monograph of the Tomb of Maya, does not mention the identification of two men. I suggest that the former must be Horemheb. The latter uh, must be I, because Horemheb and I hold battle axe and hecker scepter, respectively, on the other contemporary scenes showing them, as I, you can see on the left of this slide. For example, Horem have always hold battle axe and a fun in the scenes from his Memphi tomb at Saqqara. I often has Hecoceptor in the scene from Tutankhamun's memorial temple at Karnak. This scene demonstrates that Horem have and I are power holder during the Tutankhamun's reign. The scenes of funerary procession on the east wall of the burial chamber of Tutankhamun's tomb also shows the 12 officials are dragging Tutankhamun's coffin, which contains his mummy. The accompanying texts read, words spoken by the companions and great ones of the king's house who were dragging Osiris, lord of the Turans, Nebuchadnezzar, to the west. 
like the scene in front of the tomb of Maya, uh, like the scene in the tomb of Maya, the two visitors can be recognized by the district, distinctive shaven head and dress. The figure closest to the king, apparently the leader of the procession, must be Horemheb, since the eye is depicted as a king performing the opening of the mouth ritual for the deceased Osiris Tutankhamun on the north wall of the burial chamber. Alan Schulman, Eric Horung, and Andrea Grunilus Loprieno have already pointed out the representation of the high officials in Tutankhamun's funeral procession resembles the scenes of burying flower relief from the tomb of Ptah Emhad T, the high priest of Ptah in Memphis, M in Memphis under Tutankhamun and I. This is now exhibited at the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. The role of the mourning official depicted royal scribe, hereditary prince, generalissimo, preceding the two viziers in the procession. As many scholars have already observed, the person represented as the head of the procession is Horemheb. Although I is not depicted in this scene, the scene should be dated to the reign of Tutankhamun because as I already argued in my article in the Journal of Egyptian History, Horemheb was not the most prominent official during the I's reign. Instead, Nachtumin became I's designated successor and the commander in chief. The number of officials in all three scenes discussed in my lecture is 12. However, it is not clear the meaning of the number. We could know that a group of 12 high officials was often represented as the most influential men during Tutankhamun's reign. Now we will look at some of the most influential Tutankhamun's entourage. General Sim Horemheb had gained the most powerful political position. This man's career began as general under Akhenaten, and, his, and he emerged an, as commander-in-chief of Egyptian army. He took advantage of the country's political instability after Akhenaten's death and was driving force for the return of orthodoxy after the failure of the Amarna Revolution. Not only was Horemheb the military commander, but he also dominated all the other branches of country's administration. As the regent of Tutankhamun, he outranked the two viziers, who traditionally served the prime ministers under the king, as we, as we saw the scenes as mentioned earlier in the tomb of Maya. Horemheb was indeed a political leader under Tutankhamun, as his most prominent title, Iripad, Hereditary Prince, suggests. A collection of highly notable titles shows the range of power. He was indeed the commander of the government on behalf of Tutankhamun. Toward the end of his private career, Horemheb consciously showed himself as a wise civil administrator rather than military man which suggests that he intended to display his capacity as a ruler, as he, the text from his scribal statue at the Metropolitan Museum indicate. The inscription of a newly identified scribal statue of Horemheb from Karnak expressed his prominent position among the de 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 uh, dignitaries and the courtiers in the Paris. So text uh, read as follows. Horemheb, O great magistrate, and the company, companions of the Paris who were on the side of his majesty, look yourself with your eyes regarding the plans of the Lord of the God. He was chosen me while doing mart, and his plan being formed so that he may grant me the abundance of something. And then I will skip the first part. One who does what the Lord God's among the Lord of Thrones to runs in Karnak pleases anew. One who erects its monument, which has been ruined, in searching for doing what is effective for his Lord, King of the God. One who manifests, magnifies 
his city more than any other land, continually on every side, one who consecrated his people forever, blah, blah, blah. As we understand from the text, Horem had boasted about himself almost like a king in saying that he was chosen by Ammon. He also stated he is responsible for the restoration of the Temple of Karna without acknowledging the name of the king. These statements demonstrate that Horem Heb took the royal prerogative, usually assigned to the, to the king to the king during Tutankhamun's reign. Indeed, Horem Heb was a person who could sort of count on to do all of the royal matters. Horem Heb had his tomb built in New Kingdom Necropolis to the south of the Causeway Pyramid of Unas at Saqqara. It is the largest private chapel in the New Kingdom. As the first pyron and the courtiers were found recently. So this is the first pyron and the courtier found recently. The iconography of Horem Heb uh, in his Memphite tomb is extraordinary. On the walls of the innermost out, uh, innermost courtier of his tomb, Horem Heb shows himself to Duncan, trusted official. On the south wall, he is being received the gold of covers of honor by King for his service to the state as he is commander in chief of Egyptian army, as you see here. Oops, yeah. On the west wall, the Horem Heb acts as intermediary between the Libya and the Western Asia ambassadors and the Tudank Amun. Here you can see the image of Tutankhamun and the Ankhenaten standing on the inside the kiosk. The main part of these scenes are now exhibited in the National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. In another part of the tomb, on the other hand, Horemheb is depicted large scale, which was usually delegated to the king, as Jeffrey Martin recently suggested. Or the, on the northern wall of the scene, second courtyard. Horem Hebs gives gold of honor to one of the officials, which the king customarily represented. So here you have the image of Horem Heb on the right, and on the left you have the image of one of the uh, officials who served Horem Heb, which is uh, extremely unusual. Here is an example of a similar scene, a scene from the tomb of Merida the first high priest of Aten, showing him being rewarded by the king and queen who were depicted on the large scale. On the east wall of the inner courtyard, Horem Heb receives submission of the foreign enemies, which is also generally manifested by the king. Both textual and iconographic evidence suggests that Horem Heb had extraordinary power and performed all, almost as a ruler both scenes date to the reign of Tutankhamun. I, on the other hand, was the closest courtier to Tutankhamun. I and his wife, Tai T, had served the royal family since Akhenaten's reign, even when the new royal couple was born. Although I did not retain political power as an administrator like Horem Heb during the most Tutankhamun reign, he was most influential private advisor. Several monuments show Tutankhamun represented with I, who stand either behind in front of the king, as you can see on this slide. A fragment of gold leaf from KV58 bears a representation of Tutankhamun stemating an enemy in front of I, who gives adoration to the king as Ankhesenamen does behind the king. This image shows I as a guardian of Tutankhamun. I seems to have also played essential role in royal court ritual, as represented on several relief blocks to Tanka Memorial Temple at Karnak. I was also closely associated with Queen Anksen Amun. He had Epset, the one who extends the hand of the god, which references the role of the queen in the religion of ancient Egypt. Due to the close relationship with the royal family, I succeeded to the throne after Tutankhamun's demise. 
So these were a uh, thing as I already presented. I stand behind Tutankhamun on the wall scene in the temple of Tutankhamun at Karnak. I seems to have uh, built his have his tomb built during the Tutankhamun reign, and his non royal Shabdi mentioning Osiris has been identified. However, it is has not been discovered yet. After Tutankhamun's demise, I succeeded him as he performed the ritual of opening mouth on the wall scene in the Tutankhamun's tomb. The third most crucial official under Tutankhamun was Maya, overseer of treasury and overseer of all works of the king under Tutankhamun. In disguise, he was responsible for the restoration program in the country after the Amarna period both economically and physically under the supervision of Horemheb, who was the regent of Tutankhamun. Maya's inscription and epithet indicate his high st status under Tutankhamun. On a statue base near Karlsberg Griptek, Copenhagen, Maya claims that he had personal access to the palace, one who has access to the palace in person bearing mart to appease the two lands for his role. Jacobus van Dijk suggested that appease the two lands refers to royalty. Moreover, this expression is a part of the nebuti name of Tutankhamun, Nefer Hepu Seger Ftaul. Maya's other significant epithet inscribed in his Saqqara tomb include spokesman of the king of Upper Egypt, herald of the king of Lower Egypt, Soul one who freezes the heart of sovereign. Every seal of king is in his seal, and one who is in the heart of horse of his administrative district. These phrases and epithet imply that Maya held a high position concerning the king. A still a fragment dated year eight of Tutankhamun in the Liverpool view in the University of Liverpool shows Maya on the royal mission, leaving the tax and restore, restoring the cults in temples from Elephantini to the Delta. The inscription in this era indicates that Maya was in charge of re-establishing endowments for the temples in Egypt, set aside by Akhenaten. Maya seems to have been the actual coordinator for Tutankhamun's official return to orthodoxy. Maya built his tomb north of his senior official Horemheb at Saqqara. His tomb is the second largest in the same New Kingdom necropolis, as he is prominent official under Tutankhamun. So this is the tomb of Maya. Maya's tomb was excavated in 1970s and recently restored and opened to the public. The decorated burial chamber with yellow painted relief is now accessible by visitors. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Tutankhamun's wet nurse, Maya. She was not only King wet nurse, but also great one of Henelt, museum performers, mu musical performers. She was probably the most influential woman during Tutankhamun's reign after Queen Anxenamun. On the wall scene in her tomb, Maya is shown holding Tutankhamun on her lap, who is facing her. The two strikes beautiful, affectionate pose. Tutankhamun is represented as a young boy with his distinctive profile and fully loyal regalia. At the same time, Maya adores him with her right hand and probably has her left hand arm around his back. Behind Maya are six dignitaries. Aranzibi, who excavated the tomb, assumes that six dignitaries were depicted behind the king on the right. In total, 12 dignitaries, like other three examples discussed at the beginning of this lecture. Notably, many high officials were depicted in the nursing scene, which never appeared in the tombs of royal nurses 
of previous kings of the 18th dynasty. A number of entourage behind the Tutankhamun throne suggests the nature of the administrator under Tutankhamun. Uh, the nature of adm administration under Tutankhamun. In the text inscribed on the wall in the tomb of Maya, she mentioned the phase in order to pacify the heart of hearts of all the gods to establish their temples and to satisfy with your heart every day, like your sister Isis made. The text describes Maya's identification with Isis and expresses important phrases for Tutankhamun's restoration program. It is a psychological atmosphere in restoring traditional cults after the devastated Amarna period. As Aranzibi pointed out, to pacify the hearts of all the gods corresponds to Duncan's golden horse name, the elevated to appearances who satisfy the gold, who, who satisfy the gods. The phrase to establish their temple is almost an important phrase for Tutankhamun's restoration program. From these phrases, it seems that Maya was extraordinarily important nobleman in the cult. Maya's tomb is located in the New Kingdom Cemetery of Baste on the Saqqara. His, her, her tomb is, uh, is decorated with a variety of relief scenes, and it's also open to public. Indeed, she was an extraordinarily noble woman who supported the young Tutankhamun when his mother had already passed away. Not only was she the wet nurse of Tutankhamun, but also the great one of Kenneret. In this slide, the staff of Kenneret is presenting offerings to Maya. As a sum of the discussion to Duncan's court official, I'd like to point out the following. Two Duncan's court officials were strongly expressed in uh, both in text and images, which suggests that high officials' influence was to some extent unprecedented in Egyptian history. The most important men, such as Horemheb, I, and Maya, took on loyal prerogatives expressed in text and images. Even other vital persons demonstrate the role in text and image, which were usually performed by the king alone in the past. These suggest that the power of the private individual seems to have increased during the Tutankhamun's reign, although king was theoretically a symbolic centrality to Egypt. So as we know, the Tutankhamun's tomb was all found almost uh, intact 101 years ago. The tomb does not really tell us about uh, his time and the, the people during his reign. But uh, we, we have uncovered a number of material in the temples and the tombs. Now we are, you know, uh, go, we are understanding uh, the reign of Tutankhamun. And uh, actually his reign was one of the crucial point in the Egyptian history. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, if I can speak now, Nazuma, I want to thank you so much for your splendid lecture, as well as allowing our audience to understand more about the life and court of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. You really enriched our understanding of this period. It's a pleasure to learn from you as always. And I want to remind our audience to put some questions into Q&A. Um, before I ask some questions, I just wanted to make a few remarks. I think it's very rare for, and I'm not putting anyone down, so don't. no one should take this negatively, when 
for a scholar of your reputation and importance to mention other scholars as well. Most don't. And this was something I particularly enjoyed hearing from you. So I thank you very much for doing that. And certainly My I pleasure. meant Yes, it really is you this audience, you don't know how unusual it is. And it's done when someone is so confident and has an enormous vision of the subject. Um, I had mentioned Alain Zivi's lecture and how we spoke about Maya. So I like that very much. Um, you began with Kira. And for those of you in New York, which I assume is most of the audience, there's some wonderful images of her at the Metropolitan. So let me say that as well. Now, I'm going to have two questions from the committee and intersperse it with some questions from our audience, if I may. From Lynn, who's the assistant chair, um, she said that Tukit Kamen and his wife, the third daughter of Ignatan and Nefertiti, had two stillborn children. Uh, she was curious about that. Um, why did they die? What does the DNA say about the family lineage? At the same time, I'm curious about Horm Heb and I. Their DNA, does that relate them to the royal family as well? Uh, actually, this is a topic uh, studied by Lin. I, I know she studied the royal family of uh, uh, Akhenaten, so, right? This right. Is I'm sorry. Lynn Mayakal, a different Lynn. A this different one. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I apologize for, for giving the uh, incorrect information. Anyhow, so I know the uh, between uh, as a do daughter of Anke Senpa, and there was Anke Senpa Tasheri, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, but I I can't really say we we know really nothing about her existence as we have never found her tomb and any archaeological evidence of the existence of the the prince. And uh, as for the DNA of Horemheb and I, we don't know uh, the mummy of Horemheb I at all. So it's impossible to examine whether they are related to the royal family. This is my answer. Okay, which is fair enough. Um, talking about DNA, there's another question I have from Jean Thaler, who is on the trip with all of us. And she thanks you for the lecture. Thank and you. Asks, was Semenkare, um, could he possibly have been the father to King Tut? Was there any DNA evidence about that? Uh, we, uh, the, the mummy of KB55 yeah. has been considered as the, the, uh, the human remains of Smenkare in the past. And uh, recently, the DNA test uh, headed by Dr. Zach Horas, uh, this uh, uh, mentioned that the, 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 the mummy from KB55 does not necessarily uh, date to the person who passed away late 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, Eugene Strohau, the Czech uh, physical anthropologist, uh, argued that the, the body of KB55 belongs to a young man who passed away late 20s. So as I'm not a scientist, I can't really judge whether, uh, you know, KB55 belongs to a man who passed away late 20s or late 40s. If, but at least this mummy has been identified as a father of uh, Tutankhamun. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a big question. 
uh, we can't really mm -hmm. judge Tutankham, uh, Smenkara was a Tutankham's father or not. It depends on this uh, discussion about the date of the death of the mummy uh, from the KB-55. And I think some of the problems are when this family is so closely related to each other, mm -hmm. it's hard to have specific DNA answers as much as we would like also. Um, another question mm -hmm. from a committee mm -hmm. member, um, from Jody was about, with Tukit comment, how did he navigate the conflicts between the those who believed in the A-10 and the traditionalists, and we had some other questions mm -hmm. about this from members of our audience who were very curious on the relationship as well mm -hmm. between um, Ignatin trying to destroy the code of Amun, but mm -hmm. did to come and truly try to restore it, and that and that brings to mind the restoration steely that's been so greatly damaged. I, as I present in my lecture, yeah. Tutank Aten, you know, worship the boss uh, Aten, the traditional, uh, the the god with uh, got introduced by Akhenaten, and the and Amun simultaneously at the beginning of his reign, you know, as we as I show you the uh, image on the throne of Tutank Amun. And the stira, uh, Tutankhamun, the showing Tutankhamun worshiping mm -hmm. Amun. So there was kind of compromise, or uh, like you know that it wasn't really sudden change. So it was deliber deliberately shifted from the you know uh, cult of Aten as a, the cult of national deity. To the uh, you know to the cult of Amun, but uh, you know so sometime later, I think the you know as Tutankhamun was a boy, I, like eight or ten years old, the this uh, movement was uh, carried out by Horemheb and his men, you know, and then uh, moved uh, to restore. Uh, the the orthodox of the Egyptian religion, yeah. Um, there were some questions about I, uh, mm -hmm. his physical relation. One was from Dan Ivy asked about that. Who I been a very active and very important for um, RC. How did I manage to ascend to the throne before Horemheb? We had that question mm -hmm. also on their relationship. Yeah, I, I think you know the I was the person who had close relationship with the king, and we we don't know the whether he had uh, like broad connection or family connection with the royal family, but uh, many scholars suggested I could have been part of the uh, so-called Ahmim family. Mm -hmm. As we know, the, mm -hmm. the Queen T, the wife of mm -hmm. Amenhotep III, is the daughter of Yue and Tuya. Yes. They are also from Ahmim, right? Mm -hmm. And the I is also from Ahmim. So, although we don't have the concrete evidence, at this moment, they are somehow related, perhaps. And, uh, you know, even mm -hmm. some scholars suggested mm -hmm. the Queen Mut M. Weir, the wife of Totems of Force, is also from this family in Acme, somehow related to you and to you. So mm -hmm. this family has special relationship with the Dynasty 18th. Mm -hmm. already. So Horemheb was someone who, also he is uh, capable and mm -hmm. very active, but he had no, you know, background to ascend to, to the throne. I think that's the reason why, you know, uh, 
Kareem Hebb did not ascend to the throne after Tutankhamun, although he was uh, regent and uh, you know deputy of the king during the time of Tutankhamun. We is it had, clear for to you? Yeah. It is. We had so mm -hmm. many questions about this. Here's another one <laughs> that someone asked also. Horam Heb seems very ambitious. Um and certainly that's fascinating the relationship between the different people that you've brought up, which is so um and just as we're asking some of the questions, I want you to know listening to this talk has been some of the major Egyptologists. <laughs> but praise you, Stephen Harvey, very strongly what a brilliant talk it has been. And I totally concur with that. And we had questions even from more people on the trip. So that I liked also. Um, someone asked, felt that your photographs, they were complimenting it that it really deepened their appreciation of the scholarship and they enjoyed the images very much. And asked how much of your work is actually carried out online? What is available? Oh, what do you mean though? Of, your, of what you've written is available to the general public online. Someone was complimenting the quality of your photographs and that they could see and understand the sites more fully. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I have all uploaded my articles in mm -hmm. uh, Academia EDU, mm -hmm. but uh, I am uh, I I have to publish my uh, monograph on Tutankhamun, so which included all the photographs, the, the images, and uh, you know. Uh, or uh, drawings, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, in that volume, all integrated. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this audience should know that we, uh -huh. play, when I asked to have this wonderful talk, yeah, and I was told, yes, I'm writing a book. It'll be. Yeah. Out. When do you think your book will be published? Do we have any time? No. The exact date, but I, I, I must, I must finish. Yeah, complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been for a while. Okay. Yeah, and many studies have been undertaken. You know, and like some mm -hmm. uh, fascinating discovery by Ray Johnson. You know, as I mentioned. So if you look at the lecture uh, in the Tutankham Centennial Conference last year. Uh, on YouTube, uh, I'm sure it's really convincing that Tutankham was a was key. That's and that's she, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and for Ray Johnson, by the way, that's mm. uh, Chicago House. Yes, so we're unfamiliar that. with his work. He's a major mm -hmm. scholar, and once got involved, he didn't lecture, but I needed some help many years ago on mm -hmm. a project and he was of great assistance to me. So yes. I was glad to see you mentioned his name. Um, mm -hmm. We're pretty much out of time, but... Yeah, I'm amazed to see the number of questions. There's a number Do you think I should uh, write down the answers of the questions? Uh, I have, I I have 17 great. questions. Well, you have the questions. We can try to send it to those uh -huh. who have asked. Yeah. Um, it's been a fascinating learning experience a year ago and now once again. Thank you so and much. I thank you so much for this. Um, this virtual archaeology lecture, along with the in-person ones, with appreciation to Doug Tilden, will be available on the National Arts Club YouTube channel. I just want to tell you that our committee's forthcoming gala evening held on January 24th is when the National Arts Club will bestow the gold medal upon the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. A very special thanks from me, from Nadine, from the Archaeology Committee, to all of the listeners globally uh, involved in this subject, 
and my deep appreciation and thanks for an extraordinarily brilliant talk. I look forward, we're already planning another one, perhaps in two years, on the site that uh, Nazuma is engaged with right now. But that'll be after the book is published about King Tut. So <laughs> I thank you and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.